be nice to have somebody pray. From Dublin. Paul. Paul. Sure, brother. Okay. Very Father, good. we thank you. Father, we thank you for this time of fellowship. We're in many different places in time zones. But we thank you, Father, you are outside of and beyond time and that you graciously reach us wherever we are, whatever mm -hmm. our situation. And we thank you that you're a God who still speaks. And we ask you that you would speak to each heart through the words of your brother Bernard this evening. And we ask you this for Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen, brother. Okay, Thanks. Bernard, it's great to have you with us, brother. We're happy. <laughs> so happy. We feel, I'm sure we feel at home, you know, just, just being together like this. It's the blessedness of home with the saints. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. I just, I was mentioning that um, time I had with the young younger ones um, on Thursday, Hazel and I had with them for a couple of hours and just home, just home with young people who are hungry for God and enjoying the Lord and learning of him. It's tremendous. And we, we've had a couple with us today uh, for almost well, a good few hours of the day. And again, younger couple hungry for the Lord and we had a, a, a Zoom on Wednesday with uh, Cyprus people, Sri Lankan people. And um, again, the same spirit, God moving in hearts and very blessed, very blessed thing. And Richard mentions the spirit. Now, I have to say that I've got several things that I would like to speak on and I've actually been thinking about for many weeks but this morning as I was quiet early the Lord just brought to my heart very forcibly con concerning and I've titled it this but it's it's I think it's almost um, rude um, to title it this way or so limiting but I've titled it The Many Ministries of the Spirit. And I think it's almost, well, it's, it's so limiting to say that because, you know, but it also helps us to see, you know, the Spirit does so much, um, so much. I don't know if any of you... Uh, are um, familiar with, the, say, the Nicene Creed. And, um, you know, I believe in God the Father and so on. And you, you get down to the, the Spirit, of course, and we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son and with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and magnified. Um, perhaps some of you know that um, there are some ministers who definitely think no one should ever pray to the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, I, one of the songs that often rises in my heart is, um, Oh, breath of God comes sweeping through us. Do you know that one? Um, the Spirit is the breath of God comes sweeping through us. Um, and that's a prayer to the Holy Spirit. And so there are many hymns that are hymns to the Holy Spirit. But, you know, there in that uh, Nicene Creed, we say, you know, he's the Lord, the giver of life. Um, with the Father and the Son is worshipped and magnified. And, you know, the, I'm not sure that it's quite right to say we shouldn't pray to the Holy Spirit. But you just think of that statement, and is it right in the Creed that says that he's the Lord and the giver of life? Well, it is right, because the Bible says so. Um, and it, 
it's it's amazing the ministries of the spirit and talk about being filled with him without him you're dead and uh at stone dead um spiritually stone dead if uh, if you you haven't got him in you and uh that's true of so many people, I think, even in the churches. And if I, if I was to go into 2 Corinthians 3, perhaps you know this scripture quite well yourself and have questioned uh, on it a little bit. But when Paul is speaking and writing um, in the third chapter, of the second letter to the Corinthians, he says, um, where, where shall we look? Just right at the beginning of the chapter where he's talking about letters and he says, you, the Corinthian church, are our letter uh, written in our hearts. That's a a warning for preachers if you want to know what a preacher is like then uh, if he's in a certain church setting for four or five years you don't need to listen to him to know what he's like because if he's the regular pastor preacher in that place you've only got to look at the people and listen to the people and listen to their testimony and listen to their prayers and you'll know exactly uh, what he's like because uh, the people become the letter that's written on the preacher's heart that's what paul's saying you're our epistle written in our hearts known and read by all men clearly you are an epistle of Christ. He knew that he'd written Christ was in his heart and he'd written Christ on their hearts, whether they were listening to Christ, walking with Christ, blundering around as the Corinthian church did. But you understand, he knew what he had brought to them and what had been written in their hearts and this is so vital that we get into bible language you know one of the things that's happened in the recent centuries and more and more so roughly speaking the church of today could be divided into those to whom everything is principally in the dimension of feelings of how cool or fantastic or how blown away I was in the meeting whether it stirred me up did this did that or the other or the other kind of extreme is where people are more intellectually based and all oh, that was logical that was great that was a good message that was so and so on and so on and so on and uh, but Paul uses heart language you you were written uh, what was written in our hearts we wrote in your hearts and it says here that uh, you clearly you are the epistle of christ ministered by us written not with ink but by the spirit of the living god and it's wonderful this consciousness that he had that the spirit was taking these words and writing into the hearts and someone who came to see me and they'd been involved with masonry and that came to light as we were talking and how you know their hearts were veiled as a result of that secret society into which they had gone in earlier years and in the lord loosed them the lord loosed them wonderfully and i know they will begin to see but 
you know, sometimes the letter does that. And if I may point that out to you, that Paul refers in chapter three here to the letter kills. The letter kills. You can also say that the letter, that is the letter of the Old Testament, just the mere repetitive letter, 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 even of biblical truth, it can act as a veil that impedes true sight. Then Paul says these wonderful, writes these wonderful words when he says, the verse 15, even to this day when Moses is read, he says a veil lies on the Jews' hearts. Nevertheless, this is the wonderful thing, verse 16, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And of course, you would want to say, well, who's the Lord? Uh, the Jews would want to say, wouldn't they, if they heard Paul saying that? Well, who's the Lord? I want to see. I want to see. And then Paul surprises us and he says, now the Lord is the Spirit. Now that surprises us, doesn't it? The Lord is the Spirit. I hope it doesn't surprise you, um, but there it is. The Lord is the Spirit. And he says then, where the Spirit is Lord, there is liberty. Where the Spirit is Lord, turning to the Spirit turning to the spirit and, and can i ask you if you have ever done that I, you know I, i'm assuming that all of us have received the spirit and we know the indwelling presence of the spirit at least in some little measure um but have you turned to the spirit to be your teacher have you turned to the spirit to take the veil away um, so that you see with with m profound increasingly profound clarity and you understand um, where the spirit is lord there is liberty there is liberty, liberty to love, liberty to see, liberty to hear. And isn't that a wonderful thing? You see the Spirit's work of giving life. It's the Spirit that gives life. It's the Spirit who writes on the heart. So if you look down in verse 6, uh, he says in chapter 3, verse 6, that God made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills. For the spirit gives life. You know, and those of us who preach, we we must be turned to the teacher. We must be turned to the spirit. He's the giver of life. And we're back to that creedal statement, isn't it? I'll read something, you know, do you, do you remember Job had three comforters and they didn't do him any good. And then a rather humble young man or humbler, young man named Elihu came along and the first thing he did actually was tell off the three so-called comforters. You probably know the best thing that the three comforters did was uh, that first week they sat in quiet with Job and didn't say anything and probably the best thing they did. But this young man, Elihu, came along, and this is what he said. He said, um, 
the spirit of God has made me. This is chapter 33 of Job and it's verse four. The spirit of God has made me and the breath of the almighty gives me life. Uh, you know, I, I love that. I, I just uh, love the fact that that young man knew where his physical life, where his, where it came from and who was sustaining it. You know, that's of course what exactly a few people really acknowledge. People just think they breathe, don't they? But they don't think that it's the spirit of God. Do you think that way? Oh, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you that you're giving me breath. Thank you. Thank you that you're giving me life. Thank you. Thank you that I'm, you know, whatever age I am and I, I know you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's um, a wonderful thing. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, he, he, he says, I, I also know I've been made out of clay. Um, that's what he says in verse six. <laughs> and uh, he knows his organic nature as well. And, I, you know, if you go into Psalm 104, you know, talk about the ministries of the spirit. It's you just the creating work of the spirit that he's busily doing <laughs> all the time now. Just the material activities, the creating activities. I think you'll find this, you know, in Psalm 104, it says verse 29, talking about all the creatures, you hide your face and the creatures are troubled. You take away their breath and they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit. They are created. And you renew the face of the earth. Isn't that wonderful? The next time you look at a tree, <laughs> you know, just uh, think it's uh, God will that tree to grow all those lovely wonderful we had a beautiful lemon scented gum tree in our garden in Perth years ago and one or two ghost gums around the place and you know I used to look at these trees with wonder I walk along um, through a <clears throat> cemetery you know, cemeteries often have the most beautiful trees. And uh, I walk along through this cemetery and in the, in the, in the avenue that leads, there's these, uh, I'll have to find out what they are, these fir trees, straight and true, piercing the heavens. And I walk through and I feel their coolness and I, I think God is, is giving them life. You know, by his spirit, he wills that they exist and that they're there. And we have a Monterey pine, just that sort of is over our part of our house, actually. It's over 200 years old and um, it's rare in England. And God is giving it life. He sends forth his spirit. And this, these are among his ministries. And that's why you're here. That's why I'm still alive. Because he's sending through my, my physical. He's willing me to live. And sending forth his blessed spirit to sustain me, to give me my breath, to keep me, whether I'm, whatever I am in health, he's, he's willing me. And maybe in his great goodness, he, he wills health to me by his spirit and sends health to my mortal body, Romans 8. If some disease comes in, something 
interferes with me. Some uh, he wills healing, and these are among the ministries of his blessed spirit. What a what a thing that is. And you know, that's all in the physical realm, that's all in the material realm. That's that's what's going on. He wills the spirit to cause the grain to grow. Um, he, he wills that and he sends the spirit to bring about the harvests and, you know, wonderful, wonderful. Just think of it, that the spirit is at work all around you in material things. He sends his rain upon the just and the unjust. Isn't that wonderful? You know, when I, when I think of these things, you know, I go into the scriptures and ponder them. And, and then, of course, I ever come to the privilege of receiving the Spirit, which is much, much more. The Spirit is working and blessing everybody in the earth, in the will of the Father, isn't he? Isn't that what Jesus said? Isn't that what Jesus said? He's blessing your neighbours. He's breathing. He's sending his Spirit that they should have food and they should have water, that they should have clothes on their backs. But, ah... He did all that and does all that without the need of Christ's death and Christ's coming and Christ's living and Christ's dying and Christ's rising. You know, uh, he, he did all that. You know, when I think back in the Old Testament and I think of all the wondrous ministries that the Spirit accomplished in sending visions and dreams. You know, I, I'm now thinking in terms of, of Abraham. I mean, who granted that some, that incredible appearing that came to him that's described as the God of glory appeared to Abraham? Uh, you know, that was the Spirit. God sent the Spirit. God does nothing but by the blessed Spirit. And, you know, he's the Spirit of prophecy. And every word, you know, he, the Spirit was the one who inspired the Scriptures. Isn't that right? You know, he's the Spirit that worked in the prophets. He's the Spirit that gave skill to Bezalel and Aholiab to make the uh, tabernacle, to fabricate it all according to the pattern, granting them the wisdom to do that. And you go through the Old Testament and Spirit, the Spirit has made me, the Spirit, and wonderful, wonderful, but you know, when you come into this New Testament, you find this tremendous new ministry of the Spirit because of Jesus, because of his death. The Spirit can do things now since, his, since his, the, the Son sat down at the right hand of the Father. The Spirit has been sent forth mandated by the Father to do so much more. Just ponder it, will you? Just glory in that, in that fact. Just believe it, will you? Will you just realize that Jesus sitting down, man sitting you know that old hymn that came from China translated into English? You know, there's a man in the glory whose life is for you. Do you know that one? There's a man in the glory 
And oh, that man in the glory sat down at the right hand of the Father with the right to pour out the Holy Ghost upon men and women of any color, doesn't matter what, of any background, rich and poor, oh, slave or free, it doesn't matter, those who will hear the Spirit, turn to the Spirit who is the, the Lord, who will lead them to the Son, who will bring them to the Father, and you know the Spirit has now got this mandate to transform you, to bring you to glory, to bring you to the right hand of the Father, to make you dwell together with Christ in heavenly places, to make me into a holy man, to make you into a holy person, male or female, and in doing that, bless the name of the Lord to bring Christ's life into you. The Spirit has been given this joyful, glad, positive, life-changing ministry, regenerating your spirit, causing you to believe, causing you to be transformed, making you new creatures, making me new. This is the blessed spirit. Rejoice, O oh people of God. Rejoice, young woman. Receive the Spirit, young person, young man. Turn to the Spirit, unbeliever. Drink of the Spirit of God. Isn't this wonderful to talk this way? Do you believe it? Do I believe it? Not enough. Not enough. Not enough. Richard starts us off, and he started us off, we'll be filled with the Spirit. Do you remember? That's why I felt confirmed. I had two other subjects I could come to you on, and I felt confirmed. No, Lord, okay, it's the Spirit. Will you want us just to magnify the Spirit that comes from you and does your best? bidding, blessed helper, comforter, you know, wonderful Jesus, don't you love him? You know what he called the Spirit, don't you? You do know, don't you, what he called the Spirit? When he told those, those fearful disciples, the 11 of them that were left, for one had gone, or Judas had gone out, and he was just with the 11. And he said, oh, I've got to go away. And if I don't go away, the comforter will not come. You know that word, don't you? That comforter, parakletos. You know, the one called alongside to help, to convince the advocate, the one who stands on your side, the one who convinces you <laughs> you know, the one who makes things plain, blessed spirit. And, you know, I could go like this because you, you begin to go into the, the letters and no spirit, no church. No spirit, no church. Just a society that gathers around the Bible. You know, no spirit. No singing of any worth. If it doesn't come by the Holy Ghost, if it's not coming from a, a singer a so, uh, who's filled with the Holy Ghost, it's just noise. Words might be okay, but, you know, this is the, let's magnify the Lord who is the Spirit. He is to be magnified for he is truly God. He's the Father's blessed servant. 
and the son's blessed servant. No wonder when he feels you and works in you, he turns you and makes you into a servant of God, a willing servant of God. You know, I turn, you know, into that, that revelation book now. And I, I go to the last reference of the spirit. All right, I go to the last reference in the last chapter of, of the revelation book. And you know, I, I read this and these words here and I find something wonderful here. And it, it's this last reference to the spirit. Here he is. And it says down here, verse 17, he's done something tremendous. He's done something tremendous. The spirit and the bride say, come. You say, well, what's tremendous about that? Now I heard my wife say something today. You see one of our precious friends died yesterday. Uh, cocky, someone we've prayed for here on this, I think this one, this, this meeting. Cocky went home to the Lord yesterday and He's leaving Rebecca and precious wife from mainland China and uh, the two boys, Johnny and Joshua. And they're in their upper teens and twenties. And uh, my wife said, I'd be ready to go. I, he's in the better place. That's what my wife said today to these two young people. Oh, she's in, she's in utter agreement with God. You know, the Spirit's done a wonderful work in my wife. You know, I hope he's doing a wonderful work in you where you're coming into such agreement that all you want is Jesus to come. <laughs> you know, Jesus to come. Oh, Jesus, the spirit and the bride, they say, come, come. They're in utter agreement. Not stay away, not let me do this, do that, do the other, but they've just come to that place where the things of this world really don't matter at all, your possessions. You know, your houses, your cars, your this is the that's. Your, my heart is full of Christ and longs its glorious matter to declare. Of him I make my loftiest songs. You see, that's what the spirit produces in a man's heart, a woman's heart. My, my heart is full of Christ. And this is the, this is the, the final mention of the spirit what a work he's done what a work where he's brought all your powers into this great agreement oh jesus come and if we're still here look at these words again in verse 17 let him that hears say come and let him who thirsts come, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. When I think of this work of the Spirit in, in the bride's heart, am I part of the bride? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. And what does the bride say to the thirsty? Is there anyone here in this meeting who's thirsty? Come and drink. 
good old Spurgeon. Have you ever read some of old Spurgeon's sermons, eh? You know, that man who was a Calvinist who'd always make an appeal at the end of, of his sermons. He'd always bring people to a, a, a calm. That was, that was the spirit in him. He was part of the bride and his heart was filled with the water and out of his innermost parts they were flowing. <laughs> and he's saying, come, come, come. You see, this is, this is the kind of ministry the spirit accomplishes in his people. I hope I'm not talking in riddles. You know, I, I hope that you are in the communion of the Spirit. Let me, let me take you back into a psalm. And, you know, it's because I want you to be very personal about this. A psalm you all know. I want to be, you see, because this is something of where the Lord through the years would bring us all from the youngest to the old. Those of you who are young, don't be afraid. It's a, it's a walk. It's a step by step. It's a going deeper. Do you know, we had a meeting years ago in our church in Exeter. This is years ago. This is near 50 years ago. And God was moving among us. And uh, there was a loads of us young people in this church and there was an old widow lady and she was an Anglican Episcopalian minister's widow. She, uh, she, she was old, her name was Kay Ainsworth. And dear old Kay, why well, in the meeting there was a vision. And the vision was all these young men, and the meeting was filled with young men. And there was all these young men in, in the vision. And the person who brought the vision said, and they were going in up to their ankles, and they were paddling around, and they were enjoying it, and they were singing, and they were tremendously glad. <laughs> and then they were backed out, went in, went out, went in, went out, played around the edges, and then one or two of them went in, and they went in more, and they went in more, and went in more, and went in more until you couldn't see them anymore. They were just in the waters and being carried by the waters. And this old lady, Kay Ainsworth came to me and she pointed in my, under my nose with her finger and she said, Bernard, that's got to be you. You must keep going in. That's what she said. And I knew she was right. And you see, you, those of you who are younger, don't be afraid. You just got to keep going in, into this great unknown that is God who's really known. And you've got to be in some ways very individual about this. Like David was in his famous Psalm 23. You know it so well. He's being so individual, so personal. The Lord is mine. He is mine shepherd you know you you've got to talk like that sometimes my brother my sister my elder sister older sister older brother he's still your shepherd and you know the lord is he is my shepherd this is a great fortification my brother and sister against all the would-be's that are around about you, that promise so much. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. He, everything there in this psalm, it's so well known that we almost trip over the words, you know, surely, 
goodness and mercy will follow me. You've got to be that person. This is what the Spirit in his wonderful ministry produces in us. He makes the shepherd real. He leads me by waters of rest. And here's one of his one of his wondrous ministries, my brothers and sisters. You know that next phrase, he restores my soul. Did you know that the word for restore is rooted in the idea of repentance in the Hebrew? He causes my soul to repent. He causes my soul to repent. The Hebrew root is right back there in repentance. What rest repentance come brings. Let me tell you a recent story of a precious lady who, well, just recently there she was and a great sorrow has come into her life and and then the enemy taking advantage of her vulnerability you know she she has fallen she has fallen badly and you know of course we're in touch we're talking we're praying and so on and i i wrote to her and i said to her because she she said to me she said uh, you have no idea emphasis on the you you have no idea of the turmoil my soul is in and I wrote back to her and I said to her, yes, my sister, I, I do know. I do understand turmoil. I do understand. I said, you must understand yourself that others have passed through such things as this. And I said to her, you realize that your passions are tossed, you're this way and you're that way, your feelings have been moved, your heart has been just trampled upon and you're here, you're there, all over the place. And, and yet you are a woman who has known the spirit you know the spirit. Do you realize that there's a place deeper in you? If you live up there in the realm of your feelings and your mind, your mind saying, well, I have the right to this. Well, I didn't have it in the earlier part of my life. I can have it now. And your mind is going through all the excuses and the accusations and all of that. And you won't get any answer there. I wrote to her, but there is a place that's far deeper in you. And there is a voice that's speaking there. And there is a counselor who is just present there. There is a, a, an author down there. The shepherd's voice is there. And that's where you must go. You must go there and you must listen there even when you are in the presence of enemies in the shadow of this death. You must go down there. That's where the spirit is speaking. His speaking may just be peace is this way. Repent. He leads your soul to repentance. He causes you 
He restores your soul to its wholeness. Let it happen. Go there. Lie there. Be there. And I go to another psalm that is intensely personal on this. And the spirit is not mentioned, like the spirit is not mentioned in Psalm 23, but he's there. 91, Psalm 91. This time they think it's Moses. You know, they think that Psalm 90 and 91 were all one psalm in the beginning and then somehow got divided. The meter is similar and so on. And if you compare 90, 90 is in the we. You've been our dwelling place in all generations. You know, it, it's, it, it's, it's in the plural. It's all in the plural. And then Psalm 91, you come into the personal. There are times when you must be personal because the only way you can be a real blessing in the plural with the bride, the other members of the bride is when, when you're living right in the singular, in the individual. He who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty what was i telling that lady in that letter i wrote to her when i said go down deep deep to where the spirit though grieved is yet present in you the spirit doesn't go away you see one of the things that i've learned is that some of us are drama queens that's not just ladies that's men you know as well we get stuck up here in our heads some men live their lives in their brains and they're just up there and that never they never come to that blessed harmony of being where spirit, soul and body are united in one whole. They live more in the soul powers of the brain, you know, and there are others who, who live their drama queens in the feelings, you know. <laughs> They're so expressive and demonstrative and if it doesn't feel good, it must be horrible. And they're, they're not going down. What was I telling this lady? I was telling her to go to the secret place in her heart. That's what I was saying to her. The secret place of the Most High. You know, the Most High is in the deepest part of your being. Do you know that, don't you? He's, he's there, the Most High. The spirit, the secret place of the Most High, and go there and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You know, he's he's talking in Old Testament terms, isn't he, to, about a place <laughs> where where no more than twenty people could have ever got in there. You know. And he's, he's telling the whole nation as individuals to go in there, go in there. You, you know, the secret place in the Old Testament days was a cube, wasn't it? A cubicle room. Do you remember it? Do you remember the wings? You know, go under, let him cover you with his wings. Do you, do you remember the cherubim wings spread out, touching? You remember where the blood was speaking and the gold was there and, you know, go in there. And he's telling the nation, he's saying to them, you can all dwell there. So, you, you know, he's not talking about a, a physical place. You know, we can, we can all come in there simultaneously. We can all live in there. You know, it's, it's that secret place in heaven that is connected with the secret place in your heart, in that deepest part of you. And 
so often you've got to go down there he singular you know verse 2 he says i will say of the lord he is my refuge and my fortress my god in him i will trust this is the kind of life the spirit would minister to you this fellowship in the deepest place and and the result and mark this clearly you know mark it clearly he those who dwell there shall be delivered verse three from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence my wife calls this pandemic a pestilence and it is a thoroughgoing pestilence and it is one of the things that god is using to shake proud man and proud church to shake proud people one of the things he's using god at this time is piling up tremors the death of george floyd set a tremor god sent it he's wanting to shake what's shakeable crt is something because in the end you can't just say god allowed if god allowed there was motive in his allowing of it and he only works to do good ultimately that's what he's wanting to do and we should take the shakings and the shakings are to bring us down to the deeper place he shall deliver you from the, the perilous pestilence he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge it's tremendous you know it's also personal it's also individual and look what he says a thousand and they are they're fallen already a thousand will fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand verse seven but it shall not come near you only with your eyes you shall look and see the reward of the wicked because you made the lord who is my refuge even the most high your dwelling place no evil shall be for you there is a place right in the heart of god a place where sin cannot molest there is a place there is a life into which the spirit would bring us and in which he would fellowship with us and bring us into sweet conformity with all the mind of god he would take away from you the anxieties and worries this is all part of the ministry of the spirit he would bring you and me into such a profound and deepening rest that you can smile at the enemy my brother and sister you can make your bed in hell and you shall not be touched this is the truth of it this is the ministry of the spirit this is marvelous and this is what he's talking about here yes he will give his angels charge over you when necessary he will do so those who are dwelling in this kind of life a plague shall not come near your dwelling these are the things that he says you shall tread upon 
you shall tread upon. You know, as soon as I read, you shall tread upon, immediately my mind goes flashing into the New Testament. And where does it go? Where does it go? It goes into John's Gospel, chapter 6, for instance where our Lord Jesus came to fearful di disciples and he came to them on a lake and he was treading upon a storm and the waves and the winds. He was treading upon them. They shall become, and you remember Caleb, don't you, a man and Joshua, his friend, they were men who were living. That they, they shall be bread for us. Others were saying they're like grasshoppers, the enemies. They were saying, oh no, we, we, we shall eat them up. You see, you say, where does this come from? Where does this come from? This is the ministry of the spirit that is conveyed to your spirit in the mystery of your inner being. And gradually it comes up through into your soul and your consciousness and your understanding, sometimes with flashes of thunderous light and uh, lightning blasts. And you see, it comes from this deep rock-like place. That's where it comes from. It's part of the ministry of the spirit to convey to your innermost consciousness that's deeper than consciousness to your spirit the rock like faithfulness of god that's what it's all about that's what it's all about that's what it's all about oh god says in verse 14 this is how the lord answers the man because he has set his love upon me Oh, set your love, brother and sister, upon him. Set your love. Set your love. Be very personal. Set your love upon him. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name he shall call upon me and i will answer him i will be with him in trouble i will deliver him and honor him with long life i will satisfy him and show him my salvation this is god speaking to the man who is dwelling in the secret place under the shadow of the almighty under the shadow of your wings there's a song about that isn't there wonderful and this is god's answer to him to you i don't know i, I think of the you know the idea uh, i've heard it you know that well, you know, you shouldn't go there, you shouldn't go there, goodness me, the, the devil will get you if you go there, or you go there, or I've heard these sorts of things, superstitions in the churches, you know, you shall tread on the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent, you shall trample underfoot. Isn't this an amazing thing? And then God says, because he has set his love upon me, I will do this. I will do that. I will. And finally, I'll just take you briefly into the Revelation book again, because I want to magnify the spirit just a little more. And this time I'm going to take chapter one and if you go there and I find 
And I'm going to take these seven spirits as being the Holy Spirit tonight. And here they are. We have a basis for saying, well, it's a way of talking about the Holy Spirit. You know, because you remember in Isaiah 11, you know, there's the sevenfold spirit. So we have a, an Old Testament ground for taking these seven spirits before the throne. Here's what they're saying. You know, this is chapter one, and it's in the second half of verse four. This is what the Spirit's saying to you right now, if you will listen to him. These are his first words. Grace and peace from him who is, who was, who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Ah, I listen to the spirit. Slowly I have learned. Slowly I am learning to listen to the spirit. Oh, how I thank God for his ever present reality to me. Nighttime, daytime in the car, doing a little work here, doing a little work there, talking to this one, talking to that one. Oh, I thank God for the, for the unceasing presence of the Spirit. And the first things he says to me, grace and peace to you, grace and peace to you. This is the, the wondrous thing Hear him, brothers and sisters, grace and peace. You know, he, how can I expect to understand anything in this Bible book, wondrous as it is, without him who wrote it? Blessed Spirit wrote it, didn't he? Am I right? Am I wrong? You say you use men, yes, I know, but it was he who did it. Is that right? Oh, no wonder dear Paul said, when they turn to the spirit, the veil will be done away. You know, and then I, I take you on thinking about the blessed spirit. And he, he, here he is. I, I want to pass over what he's saying in chapters two and three at this point. Because he's saying things, you know, blessed are those who have ears to hear what the spirit's saying to the churches saying to the churches not said to the churches you know oh well, he said that 20 years ago oh he said that 500 years ago oh he said that in the first century that's what he thinks no it says he's saying it says it's it, it's continuous it's what he's saying to the churches you know he's saying He's saying, he's saying. And you know, I come into chapter four and I find the seven spirits again and here they are, isn't it wonderful? There they are. And it says here that they're uh, like seven lamps. Verse five, second half of the verse. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne. Oh, yes. Yes, I know. I know that's a great description of you, you blessed Holy Ghost. Perfection. Perfection of fire. <laughs> Did you ever used to sing that hymn about the fire? You know, let the fire fall. You know, the Holy Spirit is fire. Amen. Well, where does he fall from if he comes? The seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. Does he bring you there sometimes? Does he bring you there? In some of the, the meetings that you've been in, in your church, has he brought you there so that the whole congregation 
he's brought you to be where he is burning and you're burning before the throne. We've been in meetings like that. He wants to bring us there. And he wants to be burning in our hearts. I wish I could express this better. I wish I could help us to understand that he's both there in the heavenlies and you're in the heavenlies. And yet he's here because the earthlies are in the heavenlies and in the spirit it's all one and we can burn and I can burn in my heart and you oldies sitting there would you mind me saying that an oldie speaking to oldies we can burn and burn until we burn out for him amen that's the spirit ministering his fire and of course burning lamps burning torches tremendous lighting 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 oh bring light in your churches lord there is a church very dear to my heart that's starting meeting in person again tomorrow not more than it's less than a mile from here oh lord burn in that place they're going to meet in person again for the first time for 16 or 17 months. Oh, burn among them, Lord, by your spirit. Ah, amen. Isn't it great? Then, then I come into chapter five and I find the, the blessed sevenfold spirit. There he is this time. Oh, he's absolutely joined to the lamb. Look at him. Look at this spirit. There he is, verse 6. Uh, I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth i mean i just mingle these things in my thinking and i think yes there he is burning before the throne there he is in my heart burning there he is isn't it wonderful saying grace and peace to you there there he is now with all authority sent out into all the earth isn't it great the authority of the horns and the, the seeing, the discernment of the eyes sent out into all the earth. Oh, the, oh, the motivating power of the spirit. Oh, the enabling power of the spirit. Oh, the strengthening power of the spirit oh the spirit in you the spirit in me the spirit in heaven the spirit sent out into all the earth amen so that's my exhortation to you tonight i, I hope it uh, that there's some some grasp, you know, many years ago, I was in a, a bilingual church, a Pentecostal church it was, and the assistant pastor interpreted for me into their language. And there was a lot of people there. And I spoke from, I spoke from Genesis 24, the father seeking a bride for his son and sending out the servant. And I spoke all about the servant. God the father seeking a bride for his son, sending out the spirit to find the bride for the son. 
And I spoke all about the wonderful person of the spirit as best I could in those days. And there was quite a response that night. And when everything had calmed down and people had gone and I was sitting with the pastor and his wife and the assistant pastor, do you know what they said to me? The pastor and his wife said to me, we've been in the ministry for more than 20 years in the churches in our country. This is the first time we ever realized the Holy Spirit is a person. We never knew he was a person. We thought he was power. And the, the young interpreter, assistant pastor, he said, yes, me too. I never knew that the spirit was a person. Isn't that amazing? A person to be grieved. You know, I believe we grieve him by, by just ignoring him, by not cultivating. I said to a young man this evening, who was, I spent an hour chatting to on the uh, WhatsApp. I said, my young brother, you must cultivate the spirit spirit you must call, cultivate and so I come back <clears throat> the spirit says one or two other things in the revelation but we'll skip those but we come back to that last one. Oh, the spirit and the bride that's what thrilled me just in absolute unison <laughs> absolute unison come Lord Jesus come come hallelujah amen may the Lord bless his word unto our hearts and glorify his name may you find our friendship <laughs> more and more now, can I say to you one last time, be very personal about this. Be very individual. Dwell under the shadow. Say to oh, confess it. The Lord is my shepherd. He is. He is. Surely goodness and mercy, it shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's something, there's something I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. I'm in a house here in, on a hill in my city of Exeter, you know, but I'm living in the Lord's house. Exeter is the Lord's house. England is the Lord's house. The United States is the Lord's house. You in America. You know, Canada is the Lord's house. You in Malaysia. Yeah, Malaysia is the Lord's house. China is the Lord's house. You know, it's all the Lord's house. You know, nobody else owns it. He owns it. And one day he's coming to his house, brothers and sisters. He's come into his house and he'll come to those who have been stewarding it. He'll come to the Bidens and the Clintons. He'll come to the Borises. He'll come to the, oh, all of them who've been stewarding it and they haven't been his servants. They kept him out of his house. He's going to come. But for you and I, the Spirit will teach us to live in God's house. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone.
Amen. Thank you, Richard.